Hi. We'll we'll start now. Um, the next and last entry for today is purity. What is it that is so comforting about the narrator's voice? And is conflict always predicated on some kind of agreement? What does the hammer strike when it does? And why do I hate this word, yet choose to speak of it? Um, I am really genuinely um, extremely grateful to the spirit in which Hassan Khan has taken our invitation uh, today. And Hassan Khan, of course, an artist based in Cairo, um, but who many of you will know uh, has at least two sides to his practice, to his personality. There's Hassan Khan, the, the visual artist, uh, whose film uh, was shown and documented this year, whose many works were uh, shown in Istanbul at, his, uh, at, a, at a solo show at Salt. And then there's a, there's a Hassan that many of you will have grooved to. Um, and uh, and these, these performances often take place in clubs or music festivals. And I, we approached Hassan to say, well, we would really like you to think of um, making a definition. Um, but instead of speaking, um, call upon all the, uh, all, the, all the instruments in your repertoire, which includes his, his, I think, incredible precision with words and with language, and also with music. And, and actual instrumentalization. So we're seeing the debut of, uh, of a piece today. Um, and, and in my mind, I, I like to think that this invitation has, has been taken in this spirit uh, of, of probing his own practice. So please join in welcoming Hassan Khan. Thank you. Well, so why am I here today? First and foremost, the writer of these words has decided to step aside and let me, your narrator, help you navigate through a series of situations. Second, and maybe only by chance, it is because we try to speak of a word here, my word of choice, or to be more accurate, the writer's choice, that makes him highly uncomfortable. Purity. It is a word that I have to admit makes me uncomfortable as well. For in our world, that is the world of the writer and I, we see it as something dangerous, that only concretely exists as an idea yet is manifest in the assumptions that precede actions, in the things we want and are afraid of, in what we might call justice, in the social order, in an expensive gift a tycoon gives to his trophy wife, in lineages and symbols, in secret orders, in the fake science of horses, in economic systems, in public five-year plans, in the act of recitation, in the known.
This could be any group of people sitting together somewhere. They have met before. They meet every day. They chit-chat, passing time and searching for moments of satisfaction. This could be a group of privileged expats in a city, in a private club, language teachers in the staff room, members of the bourgeoisie in someone's living room. This could be people on the subway going home, jammed in a bus going to work, or maybe in a tea shop or a coffee shop. Elsewhere, this could be a cafe or a bar. These are a group of people. They might be speaking to each other, or they might be speaking to others. They are talking about people, other people. Is there anything else to talk about? And so, where should we begin? In the staff room of a foreign language school in 80s Cairo? Yes, why not? And so, what was Miss Heard heard to say? Medianne is quiet and diligent, but totally afraid of everyone else. Ahmed is always trying to hide. Reda is developed for her age, and the boys all stare at her and look away the moment she notices. Rania knows she's pretty and is using it to make everyone else suffer. Our cleaning lady Fatma has broken a vase one more time. If she does it again, I'll have to let her go. And what did Mr. Barker respond with? It's Robert Smith's fault he can't control a class. Doesn't seem to get it, he's too friendly with everybody. While Mr. Smith, at the exact same moment, in a snide side comment, was overheard saying, Jane Hurd is a big fat cow. She thinks she can get ahead by... But let us not forget Mr. Martin who, being totally fed up with everything, stood in the middle of the staff room one day and said, You're all so banal. Which Mr. Barker totally ignored, continuing his conversation with the Arabic teacher about how the European team beat the locals last evening in football. Listen, my dear, we beat you 4-0, and that's just how it is. We'll always beat you at football. Of course, all this happens under Miss Bullen's watch. She demands obedience, but has never been happier than when shouting at little boys. Here comes the old dramatic man. He is supposed to know some secret, the accumulation of experience, to have looked at death long enough to understand something. And that may be so, but he is not here for this. He is here to make statements. Well, well, well. One day, you will realize that you were brought up watching people who cried over their broken dreams, a supposed glorious past where everything was okay and people loved and lived freely, the promise of a future that only made a generation bitter and toxic, this promise made out of an imagined glorified purity. Or, as Ahmad Negi, the writer who holds his anger tight, says in a fictional interview with himself that he recently posted on a social network site, I only stand by my cock and belly and friends. Listen, wait, 
there is still more I want to say. These people have all, however, implicitly agreed to something. And what is that exactly? Is it a simplification of everything happening to them into broad strokes, generalizations, clearly held positions? Or, or is it just the ability to go shopping at the mall on a Friday afternoon? Let us leave this old man in peace for now. The place I want to take you next is a place I will not describe. It is not your home or my home. However, it is a place that I've imagined over the years. A place I have kept close to my heart. A place where people go without choosing to. Without noticing, they find themselves there. It's a dinner table where everybody has suddenly gone silent because they all know what everyone else is thinking at that exact moment. Or maybe it's two people sitting in a cafe, a relationship gone right or wrong in a single glance. And let us remember always that even the cheesiest song can save your life one day. And so, Ahmad and Hannah, Yusuf and George, Shahda and Mahmoud, Nawal and Fatin, Rida and Hussein, or someone else, anyone else can be there. knew he could achieve anything he wanted in his life if he tried hard enough. As a young boy, he prided himself on his ability to be aggressive, although, of course, he was also afraid. Fear never entered Riddle's heart. It was not a decision she made. It was almost maybe biological, an accident of birth. Fear never entered her heart till the moment she wanted something that she thought she could get. Faiz, the rich drunk, sits in the corner. He indulges himself and drives himself further into a state of self-pity. To do so, he finds ways of undermining himself. What he is ashamed of is how he displays his own ego. What he cannot bear to hear is the sound of his own voice. Insistently bragging, showing off his expensive watch and generosity. Only later is he unable to sleep comfortably as he remembers every moment of the night in vicious detail. Hedim was a knight, John an opportunist. So what do we have here? A way of encountering others? A secret place where agreements are made? And if that is so, then why can we not imagine that as a place beyond? A purity of will and intention? A racial dream? A civilization on the brink? Hmm. Let us see... What can we propose instead? A young woman. The young woman who lives inside the old woman who looks young, who has never achieved what she thought she should achieve. I always thought that everything that was rightly mine was coded in the universe. Only later on did I realize that this is just not how things are. And it made me very sad. Or... The old woman who is old, who suddenly found herself in the wrong place at the wrong time. Surrounded by a family, her family, who unfortunately 
belonged to a different race. What was she then to do with her carefully cultivated prejudices? Italy is shaped like a boot so as to kick you Arabs and Africans out of Europe. And also the young woman who wore her sense of propriety like a glamorous fur jacket. I know this better than you ever can. Whatever you meant to say, I've known it because it can only be in relation to me. And so I have to protect myself in ways that you can never imagine. And therefore, between the brave knight and the brave opportunist, between those who love and hate, between those who aspire and are content, there is only a blurred line, something that cannot be spelt out. Yet, in some bedroom, there is a teenager who is right now reading an excellent sci-fi novel. The novel revolves around a future society where humans have become telepathic due to the genetic mutations that took place following a nuclear war between post-Marxist Brazil and neo-New Labour UK. Massive psychic force field regulators have been used to protect everybody's privacy and to make sure that these potentially dangerous powers are only used for commercial purposes. At this moment, the teenager is flipping the page to begin reading the hero of the novel's report to the ruling bureaus on the global fuel shortage crises. Little does he know that in a few pages, this crisis will culminate in the psychic force field generators failing and that this future society will be forced to begin embracing its unknown and therefore to slowly go insane. Uh, once again, th uh, a huge round of applause and thanks, Hassan Khan. Uh, that concludes uh, today's program, where we have described the future uh, in a million words. Uh, we've uh, had an insight on uh, the place called Ramallah, a little town called Ramallah. Um, we've scored. That has another meaning, doesn't it? We've scored again. <laughs> we've scored. Hopefully some of you have scored. <laughs> Um, boom, boom. Uh, we've droned, uh, and now we've, we've, we've ended on purity. Hassan has brought us purity. Thank you so much. Uh, and now um, HD will say something about t tomorrow's program. So day five uh, of the Global